Hello, so welcome to this video series for Comp 6259, Advanced Game Design at the University of Southampton. My name is Dave Millard, I'm one of the lecturers on the course. And in this video we're going to be having a look at procedural narratives. So if we think about types of procedural narrative, uh, one end of the spectrum you might actually place emergent narrative that we talked about in the last video. So that might be uh, emergent narratives in their purest form, like Dwarf Fortress, or it might be games like RimWorld, where we have emergent narratives plus an event system that kind of provokes that disequilibrium that generates kind of uh, generates drama. At the other end of the spectrum, we have systems that actually generate stories from scratch. Um, so uh, in the past, that would have been good old fashioned AI systems like story planners or story grammars or case based reasoners. And these days we might imagine using some machine learning techniques, something like a large language model. Now, there aren't many games that actually use pure story generation. Um, and there's a whole variety of reasons for that, not least of which is the fact that you need to generate assets to go along with your stories. Um, the only one I can think of uh, that really fits into that purist view would be something like AI Dungeon, which effectively is a, a large language model that is set up like a, a text-based dungeon master that you can uh, write your actions in and then respond. But many things in, that, in this space, I think, are, are probably more like toys than, than games themselves. If you do want to know a bit more about them, uh, there's an excellent article by Mark Riedel on The Gradient, and I'll put a link to that in the description as well as the, the course notes. The real question is, what goes in here? What goes in this middle section? Um, something which is more than emergent narrative, that is more structured, is trying to promote narrative in a stronger way, create that dramatic arc, but doesn't go quite as far as, as you know, purist story generation. A good place to start might be game retellings. So we've seen some examples of this already in terms of those cartoons from Dwarf Fortress, but this is essentially where players go online having had a play experience and tell others about the stories that they encountered. Now that might be in an emergent narrative, but it might also be talking about a particular path through a design narrative, such as a let's play of, uh, of Life is Strange, or it might be some more uh, general commentary on the, the narratives that are possible in total, such as this YouTuber who's rating the, the romance options in Baldur's Gate 3. What we can do in terms of procedural narrative is think about how might we automate the retelling of stories. Um, so that's a very lightweight way of starting to intervene in emergent narratives to bring in some sense of direction, but without being too forceful about it, without overpowering the emergent qualities of the system. One approach is to do story sifting. So this is where you take a simulation and you look at all the events that occur in that simulation over time and then you define the number of sifting patterns which are combinations of events that are narratively interesting and then you look for those patterns in the the log of the simulation and then draw attention to them. So a nice example of that would be Blazeball, which was a 2020 web-based game, a sort of a fantasy baseball crossed with absurdist horror. Um, Blazeball simulated a, a number of runs of a baseball league. Players can bet on outcomes in order to get coins, and then coins can be used for a variety of different things. So for example, you could buy a blessing for your favorite team, and you could even vote by votes in order to uh, uh, affect the very future of the, the league and, and even change the rules of the, the game itself. Now, Blazeball had a very strong culture of retelling um, and huge amounts of data, all of which was made available because the developers of Blazeball released an API where you could interrogate uh, the data and, and look at past games. And that meant that fans could develop their own tools. So, for example, tools that enabled you to, to replay matches, uh, tools that did sort of team analysis and looked at, uh, at who was doing what and, and um, uh, how people might improve, and a story sifter, something that actually looked for interesting stories, interesting combinations of events, and then put those either on a web feed or made them available on Discord through the use of bots. What I think is really interesting about Blazeball is the way that it integrated these automated retellings with, uh, with manual human retellings because people would often take those things that were recounted on the social media um, and would uh, create um, uh, stories around them, would create uh, graphics that illustrated them and generally would kind of uh, remix them and reuse them uh, within the community. A limitation of this kind of story sifting is that it has to be done retrospectively. 
So essentially the simulation has to have run, the data has to have been gathered, and you must be looking back on what has happened. An alternative is to do prospective story sifting. So this is where you incrementally sift events as they arise and look for emerging patterns rather than completed ones. So essentially look for the first few events that show a pattern is being initiated and then draw the player's attention to those. Prospective sifting can be used in, in, in interactive games. You can look at what is going on, you can draw the player's attention. In one of our own experimental games, I worked with Ben Clothier, a university student at uh, Southampton, to create a game called Awash. And Awash does prospective story sifting intervention. So effectively, it's like an incremental sifter. It takes events as they arise and it looks for emerging patterns, but it goes one step further. It intervenes in the simulation or in the game in order to make those patterns more likely to complete. Now, there aren't really any commercial examples of a full-on uh, prospective uh, story sifter intervener, uh, but there are some examples of games that do something a bit similar. So, for example, if you take Shadows of Mordor, which was a, a game released in 2014, Shadows of Mordor was a, a, a third-person action RPG uh, set in the uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien universe, what we used to call Middle-earth. Um, and essentially, here you're fighting um, orcs, and they have particular uh, types of superior orc called Urak, who have unique appearances and traits. And you come across lots of these and you, you defeat them and you fight them and so on. However, there was a system within the game called the Nemesis system. And the system is essentially looking for two particular patterns. The first one is an Urak that actually manages to kill the player, and the player would subsequently get resurrected, or an Urak that manages to escape the player. And if the Nemesis system found those occurrences, then it would promote that Urak to be a captain and would ensure that the player would encounter them again in the future. And that Urak would remember the player, would then taunt them, and would perhaps even actively seek revenge. So if we go back to our types of procedural narrative, we can see that some of this space is taken up by story retelling systems, automated story retelling systems. Things like story sifters, uh, that look for, for patterns in completed simulations, like in Blazeball, or prospective story sifters that look for patterns as they emerge and then try to intervene in order to make those things more, uh, more likely to happen. That leaves us with this uh, remaining space, which goes a little bit further again, but again, not as far as full-on story generation. Now, there isn't really a, a name for this space, but I think a good term for it would probably be game mastering. So that's a, an equivalent to a human dungeon master or game master in a tabletop role-playing game whose job is to kind of dynamically react to the choices that players make and guide the story in a particular direction. There are a number of different systems uh, that, that have evolved to, to do this kind of work, um, but probably the two most common approaches would be uh, story templates and drama managers. Now, a story template is a system that has a number of templates of how things might fit together to form a narrative. The template contains variables, and the system populates those variables with things that it sees in the game space, which then take on that role in the story. Now, this is very similar to perspective story sifting, except instead of sort of pushing uh, the story in that direction, you know, making a pattern more likely to complete, this imposes the template on the on the game, meaning that the, the, uh, the things within the game take on the roles of that story and enact them out. For example, take Wildermyth, which is a game from 2021. Wildermyth is a character-driven tactical RPG with uh, procedurally generated characters. And what the game does is it tries to find stories that fit your heroes. So in particular, Wildermyth has a library of plays, what we would call templates, and those plays contain different roles. So, for example, you might have a poet or a loner and relationships between them. So, for example, perhaps the poet and the loner have to be friends for this particular play to work. And then the game looks uh, at what is going on in the game world and it chooses the, which plays it wants to activate. And it does that based on the available characters and how well they might fit the roles in those, uh, those templates. Um, it does it based on priority, it has uh, heuristics such as not repeating a particular story template within a game, um, and it also has a notion of a, of a larger plot arc. So, for example, at the beginning of the game, um, certain story templates that are due to, uh, that, that introduce the characters and set the game in motion are more likely to be picked. Having selected a template that matches, it then casts the characters from the player's party 
in the roles in the template that, that best fit them. Um, and what's really interesting about Wildermyth is those characters then modify their part. For example, they may change um, the, the, the lines that they speak according to their particular character traits. So let's have a look at example. Um, so Wildermyth tells its story through procedurally generated uh, comic strips. Um, so the one at the top, for example, where we have InShow saying, oh no, they're, they're coming in here and wrecking things uh, to Oral. And then Oral is being told by Rathala to grab whatever you can swing and come on. And the player has to make a decision about how Oral will respond. Now in this, uh, in this template, the, uh, the, uh, the role uh, that is taken here by Insho, Oral, and Rathala could have been filled by other types of characters. And if they had, they might have said things differently. So, for example, Rathala speaks what is effectively a, a command, an order, so perhaps uh, she has a, a, an assertive character trait. Whereas if uh, she had more of a passive character trait, there would have been an alternative line in the template that she would have spoken. And then when the player makes a decision about what to do, that will then change the state of that character and the relationships with other characters. And that might change the way that characters uh, speak or behave later on in this template. And of course, will affect the selection of future templates. An alternative method to templates would be a drama manager. So these are less rigid than a template, uh, more like a story grammar that sort of understands the rules of storytelling. And it intervenes in the game in order to push the story in a direction that it thinks is appropriate and it takes into account causal rules as well as overall plot goals. So imagine playing a game of chess against a computer, but instead of trying to win, the computer is trying to give you the most exciting game of chess possible. The most well-known example of a, a drama manager is actually one of the first, uh, Facade from 2005. Facade is an interactive character, uh, character drama based around a, a cocktail evening where the player is invited to the house of a couple, Trip and Grace, who have some relationship problems. And the game essentially poses the question, can the player navigate the kind of awkward social situation, build affinity with Trip and Grace, and perhaps help them uh, solve their, their problems and their issues? Facade is based around story beats, um, and a story beat is a kind of a, almost like a, a component of the narrative uh, that represents a sort of a scene or a, a subject of conversation. So, for example, the player arriving is a, is a story beat. Arguing over redecorating is a story beat. Um, each beat is itself a kind of a sequence of interactions between the couple and with the player. A sort of a, a network of potential choices and behaviours where the couple will say things, move around uh, the department and provide opportunities for the player to interact. There are also kind of global topics that can be mixed in. So, for example, discussing objects you find in the department that view out the window, those kinds of things. And interactions will execute differently depending on the narrative state. So what the player has previously said, what uh, Tripp has said, what uh, Grace has said, and, and uh, how the player has interacted with them. The, the game is essentially modelling their relationships behind the scene. And each interaction will itself change the state. Uh, that will then mean that the interaction plays out differently in the future, and it means that the next story beat will be chosen depending on what happened. Now, the players interact in Facade in quite a sophisticated way for a 2005 game. They can type free text, which is then interpreted. Now, that interpretation is done using templates. Uh, so they're looking for particular types of expressions, um, and those are then mapped to a number of discrete discourse acts. So, for example, there might be a variety of templates that describe ways in which you might criticise one of those particular characters. That would be mapped to the discourse act of criticising, um, and then those discourse acts are mapped to the narrative state to determine what happens next in the interaction. So there's a kind of indirect connection between what the player types and what happens next in the story. The drama manager is the, is the bit of the machine that's responsible for dynamically sequencing the interactions and the overall beats. So it will look at the current narrative, it will look at what is sensible and meaningful based on the, uh, the state and what has been going on, but it will also try to fit an ideal dramatic arc, ramping up the tension over time, bringing the conversation to that climax and ultimately a resolution. Now, Facade has 27 story beats um, comprising around two and a half thousand different interactions. Remember, interactions are themselves these kind of networks of, of talking and behaving and and acting in the in the uh, in the in the uh, apartment, it uses something like eight hundred templates um, to uh, to to model what the player might say, and it maps those to one of thirty different discourse acts.
and it also has something like 6,000 rules that will help determine what will happen next based on our, our discourse act happening. So if you're wondering why we don't see more games that are a bit like that, the reason is, is that all of that effort produces something like 20 minutes of play. So although this is a very dynamic experience, it's a remarkably fluid experience, especially for 2005, it's also uh, an enormously expensive experience to author uh, compared to something like a design narrative or a standard emergent narrative. Nevertheless, this kind of completes our picture of the types of procedural narrative. We've got emergent narrative on the left-hand side, uh, where there's very little uh, going on to actually encourage a dramatic art, perhaps just a setup in terms of the simulation. Then we move through story retellings, which is where we allow stories to emerge naturally. But in story sifting, we identify those patterns and draw people's attention to them. And in perspective story sifting, we identify those patterns and then we intervene in order to try and make those patterns more likely to complete. A stronger form of intervention would be a kind of game mastering approach where we might use something like story templates to impose certain types or structures on what was going on in the, in the game. Um, or drama managers, which are a bit more flexible but quite expensive to create, which kind of understands the rules of, of the narrative, the rules of how things play out. And it tries to steer the narrative and, and effectively plan ahead and make sure that, uh, that the dramatic arc is achieved. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, we have the full-on story generation systems, the, the planners and grammars and case-based reasoners, the large language models that build stories from scratch. But as I said, because of the loss of control, because of the need to create assets alongside those stories, we don't see many games in that space, at least not yet. So in summary, uh, what we've said in these three videos is that narrative in games is all about managing story and play, or more particularly, drama, getting a, an appropriate dramatic arc, and agency, allowing the player to make choices. And balancing the kind of narrative paradox, the tension between these two things, is really what uh, narratives in games is, is all about. Now, design narratives sacrifice agency for drama, emergent narratives sacrifice drama for agency, and procedural narratives try to kind of balance both um, by intervening more gently or by uh, trying to be as dynamic as possible and dealing with things that the player might do. In our second video, we looked in particular at emergent narrative, this kind of bottom-up approach that relies on sense-making, anthropomorphism and apophenia, arguably has its own set of aesthetics and requires you to design a game so that it has the space for those systems to, to kind of kick in and help people perceive stories. In this video, we've looked at procedural narrative, more of a sort of top-down approach. And in particular, we've looked at five different methods. Story sifting, which is drawing attention to patterns. Perspective story sifting, which is then intervening to make those patterns more likely to occur. Templates, which is about imposing roles and events on game elements. Drama managers, which is dynamically reacting and guiding the story. And of course, narrative generation systems, which aren't used, but the potential is growing. Procedural narratives are probably one of the most innovative and interesting areas of game research and game development. And it's going to be very interesting to see uh, where the industry goes in the next few years and what's achieved, particularly with the next generation of artificial intelligence systems. I hope you've enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.